two camera. Oh, hi, the, what am I doing? I've got the, the scrapper board. Hold on, let's try this again. Right, right hand Yamaha Pacifica natural mark, Sony wide, phone, iPhone maiden close up. So, yeah, day. Oh, what day is it now? Let's do it. This is Saturday. Oh, sorry about this. We'll try again. Saturday evening. There we go. Here's our take one shot. Okay, so I guess I need two clicks now because I'm going to have to do it on this camera. Oh, geez, how do I hold this? And on this one, second clip. Ooh. Right. Hello. Welcome to Reloved Guitars. Once more, uh, still in the midst of the past because things are all delayed here. Hello. I don't quite know how we're attached here. A bit of Velcro. Might not work. Could be back up there a bit later on. But I was just trying a little bit different uh, shot. So, welcome to Reloved Guitars. Saturday evening here. We've got a much loved but grubby old Yamaha Pacifica. What model do they call this one? This is the 112 Pacifica 112 MX. And as you can probably see, oh, I'm gonna carry you down for a, a visit. Let's have a look at this unplugged non-charging visit. Okay, so Pacifica in gorgeous natural finish. And look at a three-piece body there with a the central strip down there. This one's come with a mucho high um, thing it's kind of it's lost all of its uh, spring pull so something's gone wrong there and as a result it's pretty high up and we've got some well kind of grubby old much loved but worn um, guitar here so this has come up to me for as you can probably see in the background here some new pickups and a new scratch plate and cover at the back and so we're going to wire in those pickups and Give it a good setup, including uh, a string tree here and the new tusk nut here, um, which is sitting on the top there. Um, and so it's sort of what you'd kind of expect of a Pacifica, all in good shape. Is this? No, no, it's more. It's one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six, five piece. I'm sorry, I made a mistake there. Five piece. Anyway, but you know the basics are all really good. It's clearly in fairly good shape. Um, just not playing the way it ought to and so we're going to give it a new lease of life get everything a complete clean up as well as well as you know um, put in the new electrics and what not what have you so i think the thing to do is plug you back here in the charger plug you back here in the bendy kind of holding arm thing which sort of just about gives us a way on, gives us a view yeah that'll do for now and then we've got the wide view over here, which is a bit leaning off to one side, but I'm kind of hoping that I can do a bit of Velcro close-ups here with that fella. And obviously, if we're using the soundtrack off this one over here, we'll avoid having the ripping noise on that one. Anyway, it's small detail. Um, I suppose a lot of it will be down here, which is why I'm hoping to get the best of the soundtrack from the iPhone. That's the plan anyway. Okay, so um, here we have... Pacifica standard full setup change the pickups. This is going to take a certain amount of time to do. The setup itself will be about two to three hours. Frets a bit sharp on the end of here, so they could do with softening off as we go along. Um, so, what are we going to do first? Well, I think the first thing I want to do is I'll take off the truss rod adjuster and I'm going to take off the back cover. Um, and I want to just sort of get a look at what is going on here and what we're starting with. So if I get myself, obviously that didn't quite work, if I get myself a, hmm, this thing, sorry, not too much stuff here. I've kind of just managed, just a managed to tidy up enough to do these setups tonight. I've had a couple of days away where I've been doing some building for my, hello, come this way, can you, can you oh, close, what have I just done? I'm still running. Can I turn this in any way? Not very well. Uh, yeah, I've done a couple of ways, a couple of ways, a couple of days doing some building stuff or making a, a garden, a piece of garden furniture for my stepmom and my dad. This isn't really, I don't know, maybe you can see, maybe you can't. Uh, yeah, so I've just been doing that and uh, that's the kind of 
got in the way of guitar stuff. But I've got plenty on, so I'm pleased to be uh, back on the case. Two guitars for this weekend. Um, the Pacifica and then tomorrow a uh, Levinson Blade. Now this is cracked anyway, so that's just as well. Levinson Blade tomorrow, if it all goes well. And then um, next week we've got a left-handed Pacifica coming in and we've got an SG coming in as well. So, oh, the SG's coming in tomorrow. <gasps> Gotta be at home ready to receive. Anyway, uh, so, oh, blimey. Oh, oh, blimey. so that's overpowered. No, it hasn't, the strings have overpowered that. Wow. That's, um, that's interesting. Well, I suppose the first thing we probably might want to do, this is, this is interesting, three springs uh, done all the way up. Okay, oh, I wonder if the first thing that's happened here is this isn't massively out of tune, as in pitch up. No, it's not. Okay, well, the spring, strings have hugely overpowered the strings have overpowered the springs so let's add a couple more springs just to help this along my lord that's quite a big pull <laughs> um, and then we can sort of get this back to where we want it and check a few things out so the Pacifica is crikey that is that is quite some Quite some astonishing amount of pulling going on there. Uh, I've quite seen something overpower the springs quite this fully. So let's get the claw right in. I mean, they don't think they're particularly unusual gauge strings, although it could be. I'm not entirely sure. So we'll double check that as well because this just seems seems a little bit on the uh, extreme side. Let's see what gauge they put on there. This might actually be, Christ, sorry. <laughs> this might be something like a 11 gauge. He split his thumb. What do we reckon? Yeah. Hmm. What comes in at 54? What's, the, what's got a 54 set on there? Let's check my, check the lit internet. 52s, 46s, yeah, they're quite heavy, aren't they? That's probably why. Uh, so look, should we go 12 get oh, thanks a lot. 12 gauge strings tuner. Thank you, that really helps. Strings electric, 12 gauge strings electric. 12 to 52. Yo, right, okay. I think they were doing the, um, I think we're doing the uh, Rick Parfit here. 13 gauge strings. Come on, what's the, what's the, what do we got on there? 62? Huh? Hang on, these are mammoth. No, wait a minute. 30 gauge. 13 ending up at 56. <laughs> Uh, so I think it's an 11 uh, extra heavy bottom end or something, so yeah, I think so. I think that's what we're looking at. 15, second string is 15. I think it's an 11, 11 with an extra bottom end. Anyway, the point being is it's uh, it's putting a massive load on the uh, tremolo. Now that's something that's quite rare to see actually, because most people that I have guitars from don't want uh, something as heavily strung as that. So it's quite unusual to see such a heavy duty pile of strings. Um, so what I'm gonna do, just for the sake of this, because I do, I do want to use this. So I'm gonna get me some, see if I can get me a couple of bits of wood, uh, just to kind of drop this tremolo out of the, get it out of the, out of the, uh, out the proceedings for a minute. How much do I need? Is the question. Uh, I have to resort to the saw for a second. See if I 
can get something close. This is it, yeah, it's quite a load. So the relief in this neck will be also very um, different to the guitar when it's got 10 gauge strings on, for example. Let's try and just jam that in there. So I probably need a bit on top of that. Find me another piece, which will do. Uh, this is a non-standard. As I say, it's very rare to get such huge gauge strings at play. Let's chuck this in here. Right, I'll hold it down for the time being. So here's the guitar, sort of without the, well, without some of the effect of the big strings on it, i.e. the tremolo's flat. Um, now, we can use big chunky strings to set the, the neck relief and to do all the, well, temporary neck relief, but we can use it to set up the nut or we can use it to set up the um, level of the frets but uh, what we've got here is kind of an interesting situation full stop because just looking at this right now um, with, the, with the tremolo almost flat we're looking at quite high action um, I think with I think this gauge of string is so far off it's such a big load I think I'm going to use a sacrificial tenon set which I bought from the Harley Benton people uh, which is the tens are going to be what we use in the end. Um, the, they sent me 11s. What are they doing? I can't believe it. They sent me some 11s. Some 9s, some 10s, and some 11s. Hey. That's not what I ordered, Harley Benton. Toe man. That's not so clever, is it? buggers. Anyway, let's just put this gold fret wire there. Right, uh, yeah, so I'll tell you what, let's just ditch these. Uh, they are two. You can use higher gauge than you're actually going to set up with, but this is a bit too far off the uh, mark. Um, it, that's a massive load on the neck, and, and that's why the friend who borrowed this from Mark uh, you know, that's why it's changed its playability because the friend has chucked you know, massively heavy gauge of strings on. And of course, that's pulled the tremolo all the way forward. Got this G string. I mean, it's wound, but it's like a, it's like a cable. <laughs> yeah, so the, the weight, the extra loading has pulled the, um, pulled the tremolo bridge forward. And actually, it just goes to show that there aren't enough springs and there isn't enough distance for the claw to travel for this guitar bridge to um, stay flat you know, to, to counter the pull of the strings. That, that's a bit of a sort of interesting challenge because if you're going to, um, if you're going to, you know, set up a guitar and you, you're going to need to use heavy strings, or if you're going to buy a guitar and you're going to need to use such heavy gauge strings, it, you will have to sort of think about that is can the can the pull and the geometry of the cavity under there can it actually handle such heavy gauge strings and i would say that this guitar actually probably just about can't now that means you it's, it's a bit misleading because you can get it to play hard tailed by using a block of wood in the back and that wood would wood would um overcome the imbalance between the string pull and the spring pull, which I've just been talking about, but you wouldn't really, you might not be able to successfully use it in tremolo mode. Um, so I find that curious to, 
to be. Uh, now, I've just got a thought here. Why don't I take out, now we've got this off, let's take the plate out while we're at it. And I'll take it off to one side and we'll do the setup without the electrics in. And then I can just jump straight from them to, uh, straight from the, the geometry setup part to the electrics on the bench. Just, I don't know why, just a fun thing to do. So, yeah, so that's a, that was the first thing that caught, caught my eye that, um, I'm not used to very heavy gauge strings, so I couldn't immediately spot what gauge they were. Um, but I did spot straight away that the, the springs seemed to be underpowered. Um, so you could either get stronger springs, which is possible, or you could lock the tremolo bridge down with a block of wood. Um, and then you'd have to just, you know, you'd have to adjust the guitar for the heavier strings. And that would, that would mostly be the impact of that loading, that string loading on the um, uh, impact of string loading on the curvature of the neck or the relief in the neck. I'm just going to take the plate off as well. So, Pacifica, good, straightforward guitar. I've made the mistake in the past of calling it a beginner's guitar, and it isn't that at all. It's a, it's a good straightforward guitar um, kind of an un it's unpretentious and it's well made okay so oh that's interesting that's already broken off did i try playing this no i didn't well we'll have to take care of that uh that's the uh, uh that's the tremolo claw ground well we'll take care of that separately so my friend you go over there as well as this. So I often um, find myself setting up guitars this way. This has got, interesting, a label. Weird little label. Huh. Uh, Pacifico Woman 12 MX YNS0, whatever that means. Okay, so just having a quick look round in um, empty swimming pool cavity, um, nice fuzz, bedroom fuzz. <laughs> Quick, get rid of it before the DNA escapes from the laboratory. Get that to the hoover. The vacuum, another day. Okay, so, yep, 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 all okay looking. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go Gonna go straight. Oh, I've got this. This is curious. Oh no, that's a scratch plate. Okay, just, there's a light patch along here, and I realise it's the scratch plate has protected the um, finish from weathering with light, so the ultraviolet's not gone through the scratch plate and it's left. It's left this little white strip. Oh my lordy, can you see it? A little white strip down the edge there. It's quite cool. The result of you actually running. You are. <laughs> the result of um, yeah, the, the black scratch plate covering it up. Okay, so we've got a swimming pool wrap here. We've got um, a piece of original solder dropped on the floor. This needs to come out and be cleaned, but we'll do that after the, um, the setup part. So, uh, so the first thing I'm going to do really is I'm going to knock off this. I'm going to just check up the nut first of all. Pacifica nuts are quite difficult to find, first of all. Um, and some sellers seem to sell them. I've had a couple incorrectly labeled in the past and you don't really get to know about it until it's too late. So off comes the original plastic fella. Oh, I suppose I better get the, um, get the truss rod cover off. And now one of the things I, try to remember to do every time sometimes I forget sometimes I remember and that is to test the truss rod before we go anywhere because if it doesn't work customer needs to know about that because it may not be a viable thing to carry on 
setting it up if you can't get it to adjust properly. So this takes a five millimeter uh, thing, <laughs> uh, thing. Somewhere in here will be, I've lost me. No, I've lost me. It's the bog standard five mil, there it is. Now it's four. There we go. Right, we'll use the one in on the end of here. So I'm gonna take this and I'm just gonna have a quick feel. Wow, that's, yeah, that's not quite tight. Goes into a bit of a relief. Let's just go. I can't remember whether, no, this is just the keep adjusting and it falls off type. And I'm gonna go quite tight the other way. And that barely goes into a back bow. So I'll just put it on slack, just about on the point of slack. So then what I'll do is I'll try, try my, oh, look at that, see, I think that will work, but my worry is they're just fractionally too low, some of these. Actually, you know what, that's, I think that's gonna be just on the mark. Whew. Absolutely, barely on the mark. Uh, uh, why am I doing this in the dark, he says. Three, two, one. <clears throat> I don't know why I'm doing it in the dark. Oh, yay. Now I can see. It's just for me to see. Now we're a bit on the, oh, hellfire. Just hang on there, Velcro. You can do it. There you go. That's sort of, yeah. Right, now I'm just gonna get a, a scraper blade, I call it. I'm just gonna check to make sure that these faces are clean. And actually, there's a little bit of goo getting in the way. What I don't want to do is take it down any lower, really. I want it to work just like that. Well, we haven't got much choice. It's either going to work just like that or it's not because of the size um, of the nut. That's a Pacifica nut sold to me by Tusk. Um, and I think it will be to the absolute bare millimeter, uh, which is probably good, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm panicking because I hate the, the prospect of it not fitting. So I'm just going to go straight into place with it because it's only going to go one place and that's right there and it's on. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay, no turn to stay on at all. It's going to go one place, isn't it? Stay on, stay on, stay on, stay on. It's an accelerant. Right, okay, so I've gone from white to black, but I'm afraid that's the, the uh, I could say the price you pay for getting rid of plastic and switching it with tusk. Um, I don't, I've not found a black tusk, sorry, a white tusk nut for a Pacifica. There may be such a thing out there, but I have not found such. Okay. Somewhere, I'm going to sneeze. Oh. Somewhere in my spares, uh, there will be a black tusk nut. There it is. Amongst all my thousands of <laughs> bridge saddles, white tusk nuts. Nuts. Oh, here's a nuts. I'm going to put these down here for a minute. There's probably a better place to put them. Okay, so this is only requiring one, but let's let's put it on anyway. Um, ooh. ooh, that's an unusual addition. This pack has got a strange little factory grommet in there. Uh, something that's leftover metal. It's got. Yeah, where did that came from? That looks like the end of a screw. That doesn't want to go in there. Doesn't want to live in there. This used to, the magnetic end used to come out of here. Putting up a fight these days. Do I have to use a different magnet? Come on. Come on. Right. It's not even magnetic, so that's steel. It probably is. Oh, I can turn the guitar upside down. Well, it is magnetic, just about works. Right, bin, whatever that small thing was. Um, okay, 
So we're, we need the shorter of these, which we've got here. Let's get rid of, how can you, yes, you can see. We'll get rid of this. Um, increasingly, I recommend to people to replace the tusk, uh, replace the metal um, string tree with the tusk one, simply because we're going all out to make this thing stay and play and stay in tune, stay and play in tune. Um, you know, part of that is, oh, crap. thanks. <laughs> part of that is the additional expense of tusk, um, but only because it's, it's lubricated properties are so good that it's worth doing. I'm just cleaning this bit underneath the, uh, I could do the whole lot while I'm at it. Um, I'm just mainly cleaning underneath. There's a bit of grime underneath the original string tree. But yeah, so we got, we've gone to the length of putting a tusk nut on for the tuning stability gain that we get from it. So it seems a false economy to do that and then just leave the uh, strings to drag through the metal of the string tree, of the metal string tree, because it's not a good substance. It, it creates even if it doesn't drag t that much to make a significant impact on the tuning, um, it, it certainly does drag enough to cause pings, and which can kind of convince you that it's the nut that's pinging and send you off on a wild goose chase trying to cure that sometimes. So I think better to be done with the metal uh, getting in the way of the strings full stop. So, what we'll do is we'll put in the black string tree instead. Ready to do active service. Tried various different kind of things, nut materials over the years, but in the end, I just I concede that the tusk stuff is the best stuff to use. I got tired of, of having to work bone nuts with sandpaper to get them to stop pinging. Um, it just, you know, you spend a lot of time. I mean, the nice thing about bone is when you've got it, eventually got it right, it's a nice, you know, it's a quite a nice looking material and it feels nice to touch. But uh, really, the, there wasn't that great an advantage. Um, Okay, just inspecting all the frets to make sure there's nothing sticking up. There's a bit of, actually there is fret sprout here. I'm gonna to need to take that back a little bit. Um, the wood has shrunk and what's happened is the filler, I don't know, let's see if we can see on here. The wood has shrunk over time and the filler is the first thing that's now standing proud, that little plug of filler. Um, and you can feel it, so the fret isn't cutting the fingers yet, but all of these little plugs of filler are standing out. So I guess we'll just sand those back a little bit. Um, I suppose we could start ASAT. Um, the frets themselves are not really that sharp, so I, we may just not, we may, may not need to do anything significant to them other than uh, include them in the sort of standard polishing, fret polishing regime, which is, Oops, sorry, which is what I would do anyway at the end of um, the fret levelling. So I'll just, do, just take back these little sticking out bits. Now that does, I'm afraid, just touch onto the poly on the edge of the fingerboard and there's no real way around it. It's pretty worn off anyway with all these years of play, so I'm just trying to get it back to a smooth finish which is too much where it is um, and actually it's not so much that we need to replenish it or anything just having a quick feel of this neck is it oh god <laughs> yeah another one loads of movement in that that's yeah becoming a commonplace situation okay, so i'm just gonna take this back as well just clean these little sticky out plugs out the way. Um, uh, 
note to self, you must buy some fresh cloths. Okay. Smooth. Smooth there. Uh, now we've got quite a bit of quite a bit of wear in these frets. So this is something uh, I don't know until I see the guitar up close. So let's have a close up look. How does this work? Oh yeah, that's good zoom. Well done. Yeah, so you can see here a reasonable amount of wear. But actually I would say that's still only really cosmetic. It, it's I mean, fret wear, believe it or not, has to be really bad for it to be, to actually impede play. It's pretty advanced, there's no doubt about it, this has been a well-played guitar. Um, and, and the truth is, we may not be able to remove all of that fret wear. But that won't be my priority, because uh, unless a customer says to me, you have to do whatever you can to, oh, how far, what am I doing? Oh, oh no, I've made this thing go all different colors, sorry. Uh, unless a customer says to me expressly, I want you to get rid of whatever it takes, I want you to get rid of all that fret wear, um, uh, then, then that's, that's what's on the table. But uh, let's see if I can get this to actually stay in the right place, something like that. Uh, it's on this zoom I'm trying to adjust. Ugh. Back to one, any chance of leaving it stay on one? No, nope, it's gone back to nine. 1.2, no, can you just do one for me? Thank you. Hey. Right. Uh, yeah, so, so a fair amount of fret wear. I will get rid of as much as I can in the process of leveling the frets, um, but I won't go after clearing it up at the expense of fret metal for only only an aesthetic consideration that, that's the, the whole thing um unless asked to very specifically but actually there may be a point at which if i'm asked to do that then i'll still say it's not feasible because or not viable because if you do you'll end up with frets that are too low and it, we won't be able to play the guitar so it, there's a point at which it's not a smart option now i'm, I'm sort of now let's get on and do the messy stuff and then we'll clean this up afterwards. I was kind of half, halfway to uh, thinking about cleaning the bridge components, but it's a sort of, we're, we're doing things in different orders. So, okay, so what I'm doing is I'm loading up some cheap strings and whilst these are cheap, they're not necessarily terrible. Um, they are just cheap. Um, and I, I bought these, from Harley Benton Homan because I'd run out of sacrificial strings and uh, I was buying some other things as well. So the postage wasn't really an issue. And I got a 10 sets of, did I get 10 of nines and 10 of 10, something like that. I was, uh, I was just getting getting ahead of myself, um, which, means, which means that, yeah, I don't run out. Um, I don't mind spending a pound you know, in a setup context on a set of strings, which saves me 10 minutes of trying to either un untangle a coiled original string to reuse, or worst comes to the worst, when one of them breaks and I have to then go and break open a set from somewhere to find another, usually high E string. So having a fresh set ready to just break open for a quid each time actually saves me more time and stress than messing about trying to reuse all the old strings. Although some of them, you know, I like to reuse my where possible. But if there's a no obvious set or one breaks while I'm doing it, then I can revert to a cheap set of Harley Bentons to get the job done. Actually, they're fine to play as well. I mean, I've played them a few times and there is no, I've not really noticed anything about them. The only thing you notice is the way they're man or manufactured or the way they coil. They, they coil differently from, Ernie Ball type strings. Um, somebody who makes strings would probably tell me why, but I don't immediately know. I can't seem to be picking up these cellophane packages. Anyway, so yeah, so they're, they're slightly different behavior of the strings. So I'm just gonna 
getting these wound on. Um, these were, these strings were, as it happens, sort of tied up the way I do it. So somebody else shares the, the winding on technique. So I'm just gonna get these all done up. So these are tens, and we'll, we'll set the, uh, the neck relief according to these, which will be much, very much like the strings on the final setup. Ah, right. So I got, um, I got a nice neck the other day. Um, I'll show you in a minute. A friend of mine who often gets in um, guitar parts and posts them on the marketplace locally to me. I spotted that he had a, an encore, a red encore strap body, which I really like. Um, so I bought it off him. Um, and then I basically was on the lookout, the slow lookout for a neck to suit it. And the thing about those Indian made encore bodies, just like the Sun Mustang strats, they take a, a narrow gauge neck, which is 54 millimeters at the heel. Um, and that's a hell of a lot narrower. I mean, it only sounds a tiny bit, but it's a lot narrower than an awful lot of modern guitars. Um, so you don't find the necks to match that kind of body very often, but one came up recently and I, I recognized it as a Sun Mustang neck. Um, so I bought that. So now I have the two core components for a guitar that I can enjoy taking the time to upcycle the neck completely. And the thing about the, um, the Indian Sun Mustang stroke Encore, they're all in the same, they all came out of the same factory. The thing about those necks is that um, they had luscious great big slab of rosewood um, for the fingerboard and the necks themselves were made from really nice quality maple. So they feel great. They have a really nice vintage feel. Now the thing is, I will um, upcycle it. So I will probably um, not only refret it, but I'll probably reshape the headstock a little bit um, and maybe you know, refinish it. I'll, I'll kind of have a closer look. But, um, so, but it's just a, it's a nice start point for the, for the upcycling I, I like to do. So I get to put a brand new set of frets. They originally came with jumbo frets as necks. They're slightly unusual in strap terms because they were very jumbo. Let's see if I put, let me show you. Yeah, it's got, it's got the telltale headstock shape of the, uh, from the Indian factory. I've drawn a kind of slim dad out. I want to get rid of that little curve, that little hooky bit on the edge there. Um, but it's a, it's a nice, a nice neck. Somebody's put some oil or something, darkened the grain a little bit, but that's fine. Um, it's got a bit of kind of messy sticker stuff going on there, but overall nice, thick, genuine rosewood. It's got a few scars on it, but I'll re-radius that out. I think I'm kind of thinking, well, part of me was thinking maybe somebody refretted this, but actually it's more just standard damage really. I um, don't think it's been refretted, but I'll enjoy refretting that and upcycling that. So nice, nice Indian made neck. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. So I'm noticing straight away that the action on this neck body relationship is way too high. So we could be in a situation where we require shims on the neck, which, which would be strange because I mean, I've done it a few times on the Yamaha, so it's true actually. So let's have a look. Well, let's see if we can get down to somewhere close to what we want. So I'm just checking at this point, I'm not really looking at precise setup business. I'm just really looking at the, the whole geometry thing is, are we starting with a guitar that will work? Um, I think we are, but we will end up with all the uh, screws sticking out the top, which is at the top of the saddles, which is a little bit of a, a pain. Um, so it might be 
smaller, shorter screws would be a better option than the fullness of time. So what I'm just doing now is based on the first one that I've set, the low E, I'm just going to sort of create a spread of saddle heights quite roughly by eye at the moment, just to get close to the sort of playing action that we want. Um, and then I'll tailor it in a second. So, because basically at this point in time, even though the bridge is filthy and there's some cleaning to do, what I do want to do is get this down to the, as close to the playing action that I'll end up with. Uh, so a shim on this neck would allow the saddles to not be quite so low, um, but that would be at the expense of putting a shim under the neck heel, which some people don't like, um, some people don't mind, but others don't like the idea of. So let's just um, put it under normal tuning load. heights um, the action at the nut end is pretty good although it's, it's a little higher at the outside so I may have to just tweak two of the slots um, let's have a look okay we're on one point we go 1.5 and a low E there we are a bit more on these Everything's just, I set it a fraction too low from the normal target, but it wasn't so bad. 1.5. Mm -hmm. Okay, 1.25, 1.2, 1.2-ish. Okay, retune, I'll get another stretch. Very, uh, very resonant acoustically. Okay, so I've got the playing action to the right height. The neck relief now is pretty tall. It's quite a lot. So I'm going to try and straighten this neck out a little bit by counteracting the string bend. And I have a feeling I may have to be fighting this a little bit because it's very stiff. Um, let's see. Well, we'll try there, leave it there for a minute or two. I might be going to make a cup of tea. Settles. Mm -hmm. A little bit, tiny bit more movement in the bridge there, but I think that's because. Uh, these screws have been uh, tightened down too far, the tremolo screws. So I'm just going to just ease them off a tiny bit to allow the bridge, bridge to sit where it needs to sit. I'll, I'll fine tune these properly later. But one of the biggest mistakes people make, 
or an easy mistake to make, I should say, is to over tighten the front of the, the screws down at the front of the bridge plate. And what that does is it forces the front, front of the plate down against the body of the guitar and the guitar will f do what you tell it. So even if it doesn't want to, because there's a chamfer, a bevel or a chamfer on the front of this plate, it allows you to pull it so far down that the end will kick up and no amount of springs will um, cure that, which is where it currently just was. So I've now slackened off the straight springs at the front, screws. You can see how much difference that's made. Good so far, right? Okie dokie. So now we have time for a cup of tea. What I'm going to do now we've got the actually, the nut is pretty good. Actually, that's almost perfect. But I'll give them that good on tusk. Huh. Happy to say something good about them for once. So, what I'll do is I'm going to um, make a cup of tea, but before I do, I'm going to mark up the frets with my black permanent marker ready to fret level because the three things I want to have ready before I do any fret leveling and that is I want my uh, neck relief set within the range that I want it so I'm gonna kind of come back after a cup of tea and make sure it is it's settled in that range but I'm heading towards there uh, I want the first and last fret actions to where I want them to which is I've pretty much got them there already so those three things neck relief first and last fret action are the three things I want to get into place where I want them. And once that's done, I'm then ready to um, level the frets. So we are pretty much ready to do that. Um, and this marker pen business is a great way to help me uh, check the progress of the fret leveling. Now, one of the things I will do in the whole fret leveling process with this guitar is I want to, uh, as I, after I've done the leveling and the recrowning, I'm going to want to sand out the frets to sand them out and polish them basically back into a nice playing state of readiness to play. Um, and at that stage, I'll also take care of the slightly sharp fret ends. time oh all right i have to label all these should i i should probably should i just leave it as one hmm, i don't know what i'm trying to say should i leave it as one thing otherwise i'll have loads of chunks no i'll start again in a minute scene two scene two yes right uh, I've, prior to mm, this, I've just put some new mm, uh, that stuff onto these them things, whatever it's called. So, uh, mm, uh, that stuff, you know, double sided to uh, no um, self adhesive sandpaper. And this is uh, weeks. This is P grit four hundred grit, as I always use. Okay, so now I'm going to level the frets with the four hundred grit. Um, I checked the neck relief and it was still a little bit high and I think we've run out of adjustment. So I think that's about it. We're going to have to live with what we've got. I don't think there's any any more adjustment. That's a feature of the neck. It's not something we can do anything about. So it's, it's not bad. It's a tiny bit higher than I would like, but it's a lot better than it was a little bit earlier. Because, of course, previously it had massive loading of heavy duty strings on it, which made things very difficult to play and certainly there was no more adjustment to be done. Okay, so I'm going to um, get on and level these frets. Now, uh, what I won't know until I get a leveling is 
what we're going to get rid of in terms of the wear at the bottom end there. Actually, not just the bottom end, but all over. So I'm just going to get going with the notorious that thing, banana, I call it. That's somewhere my little brush has taken a walk. That's annoying. Um, unless it pops up, I will. Oh, there it is. All right. Okay. A little paintbrush brush, just for getting rid of some of this leveling dust. Right. So what I'm interested in the first instance is when I've done a bit of leveling, is to make sure all the notes play. they do. Um, the next thing I'll be looking at for whether or not we've got all the bends and I'll try those out when we get across to leveling the G track. That'll be when um, it becomes apparent if I have any problems in bending notes. So I can still see the, you know, some of the wear grooves damage down on these early lower frets. Like I say, that's almost certainly going to end up staying there, I think. Um, I'm not going to uh, trade fret metal just for getting rid of those, but we'll, we'll certainly improve things. Okay, let's have a... bit more to do on that top edge there but it's very good so far as I say we'll, we'll know what's really going on when we try and do some things at this low action I'm just taking a little bit more away there concentrating or keeping an eye on the the uh, fret wear down the bottom that's not the brush I want these are not the brush you're still looking for. Okay, now. Okay, so I just quick check there and I got a little bit of choke out on a high E bend across into the G department. And um, I've made videos about this in the past to explain why this happens. So what, what is it about bending notes that causes, um, what, what is it about neck, the neck radius, I should say, that causes notes to choke out? Um, well, notes will choke out if they hit higher frets, that's true. So having uneven, any uneven frets is not helpful. But High notes that are high, high notes bent across into the G track uh, will also happen, um, will increasingly happen when you have a tighter radius because the, the geometry of this travel of the string um, prevents you from having any clearance, and it's, it's because the string is actually moving uphill. From its anchor point. So if we're bending from an, bending an E, it starts and finishes here. But as we bend it across, it's not just going across, it's also going up a hill on the curved radius. And if, because it's going on up a hill, that's cool. But when it's coming off the top of the crown of the hill, it's got to go downhill to a lower point. And so it, it, can, it hits the frets in front of it. It's not bad. I can't, I'm not very good at bending tens, so I'm quite impressed that I can even bend the tens. I'm going to give that a little bit further go, and then there's probably a little bit of work to do in the A 
side of things. Um, but we're getting there. But there's a limit um, beyond which you really can't go and no amount of fret leveling will get you there. So it becomes a, a law of diminishing returns type of situation. Um, and it's important if you use this method to be able to to really detect when you're at that point because there's no absolutely no value in continuing to level if you're not if the geometry isn't going to allow you to work past that point. Right, I think that's just as it's coming on to the A. So I'm going to do the A track now um, and we'll see where we go. Again, you can see the marks still somewhere under there, but most of it will be gone. And as I say, I'm, I'm not going to go chasing trading fret metal just just for the aesthetic joy of, of saying, OK, we got rid of, got rid of those little grooves. So once I've done the fret leveling, what I'll do is I'll take the strings off, take everything off, really, and um, it all a good clean out, clean up, clean over. Why can't you just stay over there, please? No, it's not really staying out of the way. Uh, give it a good clean up. And, um, and then we'll be ready to do the electrics. And once the electrics done, we just put it back together again. So just overemphasizing this crest of the hill here, see if we can make sure we get those notes playing at the top of the hill. Um, now if we can't, if they won't, if we get sort of any, it's not bad actually. See at that point, we have to accept that what have we got this is probably actually lower than yeah this is one millimeter so that's over over uh, over egging it really if we go back to the target 1.2 that's about the lowest we really get away with that's pretty good okay so I, I went a bit lower on the E side often on the treble side I should say I often do that just to challenge. Pacifica is what I'm doing with this is what I would call bog standard and with no no insult to the Pacifica what I mean by that is is I do the same to this the guitar the principles that work here are the same as those that work on a expensive Gibson the same three components of the playing action the uh, neck relief the first fret the, yeah, first fret action and the last fret action. Those three things are at play in the uh, expensive Gibson as they are in the inexpensive uh, Yamaha. And they work the same way. There's no magic because of price or brand. And you find some, some people, I think, like to behave as if there is a special kind of magic. Um, Know, and, and actually there's a kind of snobbery that can be involved but as long as it's got strings it's got a nut it's got a bridge it's made of wood and it bends and it's got a truss rod to help you counter the amount of bend that the neck is doing then it's it's the same it's a it's a standard creature um, no matter how much a Gibson costs, it's the same beast um, and the same principles apply. So 
don't be overawed if you're ever going to get into setting things up. Well, you, you, of course, you have to be conscious of that there are things at play in a Gibson that aren't in play so much in a uh, this thing, Yamaha, for example. Um, a Gibson is often bought as an investment or something that is expected to hold its value over the years and has a lot of money tied up in it, relatively speaking, compared to a Yamaha Pacifica. So uh, there will be a great deal more scrutiny of the Gibson about how certain things are done um, in terms of you know, perhaps the uh, treatment of the edges. For example, while here I took sandpaper to the edge there, somebody with the Gibson wouldn't necessarily like me to do it that way. So there are some small differences to the treatment of the guitar with reference to their different statuses, I suppose you could call it. Good, right, that's done. Okay, um, strings off. Yeah, so, so there are those differences, but in principle, um, the, the way it works is exactly the same. And as I say, cost and brand uh, don't free up the guitar from being subject to uh, the laws of physics and the same small number of variables at work. Um, sometimes you, you do get the feeling that some people want you to believe that certain guitars are just it's, it's supremely exotic, um, you know, and, and must be looked at differently, not to mention treated differently. And, uh, you know, that, that can be sometimes because of the, the myth that people buy into. Now, um, here I've got a good set of strap length strings that will be useful. They've only been used in this set up part process so it wouldn't hurt for me to try and hold on to them so part of that process is just bending out these coiled bits so that when we come to reuse them they won't get tangled up together um, it's not a bad thing to do if you want to get second life for strings mind you like i said before if it if it it's worth having a set that you can keep back and all else fails because there will be a time when you run out of sacrificial strings and this humble Harley Benton set that's already been used to sacrificial strings once will be very welcome at some point in, in the future but for the time being I probably will go to my new Harley Benton strings just to avoid have to mess around anyway so I was just watching my um, Google stats. They're kind of funny because I I'm I pay for the um, Google Premium thing. Not Google, yeah, YouTube stats. I pay for the YouTube Premium. Um, I, I have to admit, you know, I watch a lot of YouTube, and I just got sick of the adverts, which is of course how they wanted you to feel about it. And it's a it's an effective strategy to get most if not everybody um, signed up to a subscription model which will make them an absolute ton of money and mean that they don't have to mm, eat dirt of the advertisers you know because uh, YouTube would much prefer just to have a relationship with uh, con content creators and viewers and all their revenue just come from I mean I bet they would like the content creators to pay as well but at, best, at worst, and they'll be happy if the viewers pay all the revenue that they could possibly make. That would be great and not have to play the game of advertising ever again. Um, but meanwhile, they still do. And of course, they, they've been busy, hell bent on making the ad supported viewing as unpleasant and as, as interrupted as possible. And uh, I just got to a point where I thought I'll try it out. And then I just, I, I genuinely thought about it and said to myself, you know, if I'm going to put a subscription into any one thing, 
um, I'd probably more likely put the money into one where I've got a vested interest. And the vested interest I have in YouTube working, because I have all my videos there, why wouldn't I want that to succeed? I don't really care whether Spotify succeeds. So I've kind of given myself the go ahead and pay for the, um, the premium version. Uh, and it, you know, to me, it feels like I'm getting a, a fair deal out of that. Um, of course, one thing I haven't got for this, I've got, I've got the damn thing for doing up the things, but what I don't have is the ratchet that fits this. It's not exactly a box spanner, but it will do. Anyway, yeah, so I'm done with the, the paid premium version. And I, I think I'll just carry on until, I don't know, something, something changes. Uh, but I think I probably will kill off Spotify and not pay for that as well, since I'm finding the YouTube video, um, the YouTube audio thing, God, song, music, YouTube music, whatever it calls itself. I'm finding that works pretty well too. Um, comes up with quite nice suggestions and it's quite a nice experience so why wouldn't I so it could be on the way out of Spotify because you I don't know why because you didn't maybe what you didn't do is you didn't give me a, a buy-in a reason to be to have a stake in it actually maybe that's the going to ultimately turn out to be the um, the genius of YouTube. So what I'm doing now is just um, recrowning, reprofiling the frets that I've just flattened a bit during the leveling process. Um, and as I'm doing it, I can see the sort of scale or the extent of the grooves that still remain <clears throat> on these frets, and it's it's not so bad. Um, it's still visible, and it will be but hardly feelable, so really nothing to worry about. And certainly not, not worth trading fret metal for, that's, that's the basic deal. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is I will do all of these um, and then we'll, I'll mask off the, I'll stop the video, I'll mask off the neck uh, ready to polish these all out and I'll do that off camera and then once I've done that I'll move the cameras and we'll re-establish we'll meet again down on the soldering bench ready for changing the pickups and scratch plate um, so really what it means is putting the new pickups on a new scratch plate and transferring across the electrical components from the old one uh, yeah. Now, one of the things I'll do before I get stuck into that is I will just double check the whole spacing is right. It's not the end of the world if it isn't because I will fill the original holes and we'll drill new ones, but um, it would be nice to know if somebody's selling, you know, dropping Pacifica replacement scratch plates and back cover panels. It would be good to know if they're, um, yeah, direct replacements or whether there's a little bit of modification needed. Okay, so what we've got here now is the frets all rounded off. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run back and go over the edge of each one. And I'm doing this because it just helps to take off the slight sharp, any slight sharpness on the edges of these. It can be right at the very corners of the frets where it meets the fingerboard, but sometimes you get a little spike that hurts the fingers. So this is just kind of a little step on the way to making sure this plays as smoothly as possible. As yet, I haven't done any cleaning on the neck, and so the neck is still pretty grubby from its life of playing, um, but we'll clean all of that up when the time
time is right. So after we've done the polishing the frets out. Okay, so what I'll also do actually um, with the camera off, I'll just take these off and I'll take the tubes off as well actually. I'll just give everything here a clean. Uh, I like to I like to refresh the guitar. So I'll take this little string tree off for a minute. Um, we'll take these off and come back when everything's cleaned off. It's just a nice way, especially if um, I know that Mark's lent this to somebody and he's got it back. So it will be coming years of, maybe, maybe years of being in somebody else's hands and um, a kind of nice fresh start, not only on how it feels, but a fresh start will be to play it without somebody else's DNA. Oh, okay, these are the, these are the uh, ones with the little locators. Okay, so they come a bit like the square ones actually. Now what I've started doing these days is bringing up a printout of everything that uh, customer wants. So I keep I keep a record and more more exhaustive record these days than, than previously um, because it's sometimes it's easy to forget little details and can be annoying for customers. I, I put the wrong gauge strings on. Um, not not because it's hard to change strings, but they, you know, quite rightly, a customer's concerned that if they have to change the gauge, the correct gauge, even if I send them the correct gauge, um, their, their concern is, you know, how it will change the setup they've just paid them to do, and that's a valid concern, even though if it's not that much of a change. So, little things like that can have just a unnecessarily uh, annoying impact and to be avoided at all costs. Okay, so there's that, and I'm going to just pull off all of these. We won't need this many um, springs now when, the, when we come back to it, but we'll just keep them here for the time being. Um, and this just will be a bit of a little bit of off-camera sort of um, noodling, you know, with some cleaner and whatever, just to get just to get the bridge looking new again. The springs are rusty and there's not much I can do about them. I don't, well, I'll have a look around and see if I've got some spares. I might actually have some spares. It'd be nice to be able to replace them. Um, they're, they're rusty. Uh, and Mark said he's not a tremolo player particularly, so he wanted the tremolo set to locked or down only. And I think I'll, I'll leave it at down only because it gives you the option. And since you've got the tremolo bridge, it's nice, nice to have the option to play it. And you never know, that might start you into becoming a tremolo user. Um, so this really is a stripped down to absolutely nothing. Uh, I'm charging my, my hand, my, what do you call it? Electric battery drill. Drill, no screwdriver at the moment. Um, half of my hand tools are over at my dad and stepmom's place. Uh, so I'm a bit all over the place. I've been building that garden thing for them, but yeah, I'm a bit here and there. Okay. Oh yes, the little, little, I forgot about those little locati washers. Locati washers. In fact, I better pull them out just for now so I know where they are and they don't get lost. I haven't figured out why they do that, but I will. Okay, so there's the pretty bare-assed guitar, as they might say. Um, okay, going off camera now, um, we'll, we'll come back when I've cleaned all these bits up, including the tuners, and got this polished out, um, and we'll be ready to go over to the, or oh, see you next in the electrics department. Okay, oh yeah, look. Oh. Uh, electrics. Well, I'm not doing any synchronization, so that doesn't matter, does it? Ugh. Shit. Ah, shite. Power on. Give me the arms. Give me the arms. Look at magnets. There's some magnets everywhere. Some wires, the arms. The this, the that, the things. Right. Let us relax. Let's set the heat on because it's starting to get cold. Yeah, well, 
wherever I put this, it's going to cause a reflexion, at least this side. That's going to dazzle me. Sorry, it's just going to have to stay there like that. It needs to be like that. Really? To hell with the reflection. Okay, dokie, ladies and gents, welcome to the uh, soldering department of Real Love Guitars. We've got a few different things here that we need. Doink, doink, that'll do. Yeah, got a reasonable view here. Um, okay, so everything's been done over over there, meaning I have completely and utterly cleaned up the what's it, um, leveled the frets, done all that stuff. And we're now, we're now ready to go with the wiring part. As long as I keep it in this area here, we'll be able to see what's going on. So, um, okay, <laughs> I knew I had to get something. First thing I get, the knob puller. We need the knob puller. Okay. I'll probably need something else over here, but I'll so the knob puller. So what we're going to do is so basically we're going to replace this hardware with the new, well we're going to move the hardware, the, the pots and the switch across to the other pick guard and then we're going to set that up with the new pickups and get it all hooked up and working. So obviously the knobs are going to get used. Oh, I knew I needed oh things these things oh, we need something else any minute now you can see those so we're going to we're going to do the um do the do the things right so what we're doing is going to take out these but what just so i don't have to think too much that's a nice little piece of gauze we're going to go we're going to cut this little thing off here just let free up, free up the wires. Now we've got the, the neck one coming in here to there. And the neck one, if I can just figure out where it goes. Okay, the neck goes to the outside here. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go in the neck to the outside, just so I can come back to that the easiest way possible. And I'm just going to go twink, twink, twink. And I'm going to... Um, Okay, hmm. keep those joined together, keep that joined in with that, keep that joined in with that. Get rid of the ground wire to there. And we'll keep that one and we'll keep that one for now. Okay. <sighs> right, one more thing. No, no, really, one more, just one more thing. Just one more thing. The old um, Columbo. <sighs> Take off the switch and that can sit over there and we'll just make sure well, that's disconnected right so we take off the volume and the tone put them over there volume tone we'll leave the capacitor and everything in place a very simple wiring setup now, wrong with it, just straightforward. Now, with the change out, we're changing all, for, we're replacing everything with iron gear pickups. So, um, oh God. so we shouldn't have any phase issues or anything like that. So for now, I can basically put this off to one side because I'm not gonna need anything else from there. So here on 2.4, we can bring into play the, uh, this thing now the thing about this okay in many ways it's nice to give people the plastic to remove but the problem with doing that is when you give people plastic to remove they pull it and it all gets bunched up underneath the whatchamacallit you know what i mean it gets caught and it's annoying so i'm going to take it off for this um so it doesn't get caught underneath the knobs and pots and whatnot and make a horrible scrunching mess. And we'll go for um, we'll go for a nice clean start. Now it just means we have to be a little bit careful in the 
installation of everything here. We don't want to scratch the, the pit guard from the outset. I'm just cutting out the holes here. Again, that's another little detail. Often people just sort of poke a hole and push them through and then you get the you get the silver foil stuff bunched underneath as well. Okay, so here we are. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to get the pickups and put them in place. Um, and we'll get them all loaded up if we can first. Iron Gear keeps sending these um, guitar picks and quite frankly they're too thick for my liking. Now that's not Iron Gear's fault, right? I'm sure they find somebody who likes their whatever it is, one millimeter stuff, but it's not my cup of tea. So it's Axe Tech, sorry, isn't it? Who sends me this? Oh, it's Iron Gear pickups, okay. All right, so here we have our, um, this one is the, uh, which one is this? This is, oh, God, blimey, um, I've forgotten now. Steam hammer. Steam hammer. So we just really kind of get them all in place first. Then I'm going to do some cable tying to tidy them up. And then we're going to put them, hook them all up to the respective correct places. Um, yeah, no, because they're all the same, company um, we shouldn't have any issues at all i'm going to need a different screwdriver we're not going to have any out of phase issues at all so that's going to be a simple simple enough business because they're all going to be matched from the same company which helps so first thing we have to do is let's get the bottom one in first I find this part is in some ways the most difficult part of all because we're sort of, we are working with, you know, things, springs like that, they just want to ping and fly everywhere. There's no real point seeing this because it doesn't, it's not really edifying to watch what I'm doing because then I have to hold that there a bit like that, sort of, well, I can't hold it there like that because it won't hold. So I have to find a way of pressing it against there so we'll put that through there, sort of wedge that in place there, hold it a bit, and go the right way. Get a bite on it, which is done. But just not easy, man. Okay, and that spins around. Thank you so much. Bring it back. Wedge it, wedge it in place under pressure, which of course means the minute you move it off to one side, the spring will just take off. There we go. First one. Texas Loco two wire neck. Sort of airtight when you first get them out these um iron gear pickups oh there goes the cover nice old fashioned vintage cloth wired cloth wired cloth covered wire um i'm not a great fan of this but it does the job and i know it's period correct for many people um, if you know, if you're new to wiring, I have to tell you, you have to get a mind. I can't to tear it. You have to get a mindset um, when it comes to the handling of pickups. Um, you've got to treat them ridiculously lightly. Um, they are so easy to break. It's unfunny. Um, so you just you have to kind of expect them to break so when you handle them you're, you're avoiding handling anything down there so you're picking them up by the far ends um, avoiding any of the exposed wire bits down there and then bringing them up to meet the uh, maker no meet the thing there and just assume that they're always close 
to being destroyed because it's a horrible thing to actually break one in setting that. Okay, there's the neck. Um, getting in the way of everything. So this is, a, as I say, this is a fairly straight um, kind of swap over because we are fitting three new ones into a new scratch plate and they're all the same breed and we're going to um, hook them up to a standard five-way switch configuration which is shouldn't really be any nothing, anything surprising in there. Okay, nice yellow. That's what I do like about this. They have a they do a great line on in on the yellow. That's just waxy covered stuff. Okay, <coughs> I tend to use these um, the little neoprene. Is it neoprene or latex rubber thing? I like them as the springs, and uh, possibly the only reason I really like them. They eventually um, perish and they don't work after about twenty years. The reason I like them is because. The reason I like them is because they stay on, so I can now offer up the pickup to the right place without having to hold the, the spring and the thing in place, which with the raw spring is an absolute pain, but the rubber things work great. <laughs> now this one, for some reason, this pickup actually doesn't want to fit, um, only just wants to fit. Why that is? Okay, I think it's trapped the plastic in there as well. So what we'll do is we'll take the um, other plastic off before we send this back because again, there's no plastic knocking about. It just gets in the way of things really. It doesn't add any advantage. Um, now, I'm just going to look in here. I'm a bit cluttered up now with empty boxes. I'm just having a quick hunt for little tiny cable ties which I now can't find which means they're all in the other box which is this one over here right. let's get a little handful of them out of the way right sorry about that and we got some extra blue over there right hmm. okay where are we oh yes there we are so kind of rule number one <laughs> tidy get tidy so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tidy up these two pairs Two pairs? Two pairs, yes. These two pairs here with a cable tie. So I'm just going to bring them together behind the second and the middle pickup, like that. That just keeps them from wiggling everywhere. And if you remember, we're, we've got a um, the hole in this. The cavity is what's called a swimming pool cavity. Now, the problem we've got in the, the uh, Pacifica, which is an absolute pain in the what's it, is that we've got an incredibly small gap here on, in the wood to get the wire through. And it isn't really suited to where that comes out and it isn't suited to where these come out. So it actually has to go sort of like that through, the only place I can guarantee it's gonna go through is through this little gap here. I'm just gonna double check that. It lines up because the gap coincides with the well where the screw for the humbucker goes, which is right there. So, it's beeping me. So what I'm going to do is just to sort of encourage it to do that, I'm going to get another clip in here and just bring them all together in that place. And hopefully, if I get it right, they will play the game and stay there, more or less. Something like that. You wouldn't think it's ideal to be piggybacking off the, um, off the post, but that's okay. Now I know they're going through the little channel. If you don't do that, the, um, it's very, very difficult to get through the, that channel. You can be, well, you can be pushing and poking for weeks on end trying to get the uh, wires through. And it, and it puts a lot of um, stress into, you know, handling all the components and pushing things around. It's a right pain, I can tell you. So I'm going to now put one of these through here, line up 
sorry, it's not a very good view. Line up, won't tighten it, but I'll get the other one into place. Now, some people will, um, will say, oh, you've changed the pickups, but you haven't changed the uh, components. What a waste of time that was. And I'm not at all convinced that any average human being can hear the difference between these mini pots and some more expensive alternatives. Oh, Christ, <laughs> sorry. Some more alter expensive alternatives that I may or may not put in place. So I, I just, I think the, the degree of difference, and I would, yeah, I would promise you on a blind test, the so-called aficionados wouldn't get it right, or the, I, I don't believe they'd get it right. Um, and, you know, to, to, to make such a big deal about something that we, we could probably argue for weeks over whether there was even an audible difference or tangible perceptible difference is just goes to show what a completely spurious um, argument it is to to claim that it, it's a priority. But the biggest investment in ow ow like something into my thumb. The biggest investment in in changing the tone of this guitar is changing the pickups. Um, now. And, and what Mark has done is invested in some uh, decent quality budget pickups um, that I'm pretty certain he will he will be able to hear pretty straight much straight away the difference between those um, and the um, oh I cut that wide didn't I you fool <laughs> he'll be able to hear the, the difference between um, these pickups and the ones he had in before my my experiences I find the um, that's melted a bit, but we'll leave it as is. I find the generic um, Yamaha ones a bit bland. Simple as that. Um, I, I, they don't. They don't remind. They don't make me feel anything, and it's it's not their fault. I'm sure Yamaha done a good job and all that. It's just for me. It, it's not. They don't stand out much. Okay, so I've um, first of all I've gone to cut this wire, which I didn't need to do. So I'm just going to re um, re strip it. And this is the output from the switch to the jack. Sorry, to the jack. Output from the switch to the volume pot. So I'm just going to reconnect it. First of all, I will take this one off like that. And while I'm there, actually, I won't. What I'll do is I'll put a little bit of solder on this bit here. I don't know how well that you can see that. Yeah, one, I've been struggling with this iron for a while now. I've, I've had it for a while and I've, I've liked it a lot. Um, but just recently, I've found it very difficult to get the su sufficient heat into the pot top when making pot top connections, if you get what I mean. So it's sort of, uh, it's made me wonder whether there's something wrong with it. And even though I've got it turned up a fair amount, uh, it doesn't seem to want to play the game. So. I reverted the other day back to very cheap Draper um, soldering iron uh, and lo and behold it sort of put the heat through perfectly well so I kind of think we may be maybe under underperforming a bit on this one it's all right it's great for this sort of uh, you know soldering lugs and, st and so forth but um, I can't remember what the sort of typical soldering temperature should be let's just double check uh, soldering iron temperature temperature please thank you Look for PCB I'm just giving you a general one soldering iron temperature blah 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 you have to point your solder does that tell me of course it doesn't uh, uh, what was 316 to 343 is a good place to start. Um, then 371. Well, I'm on, I'm on 400, and it's struggling to put the heat into the the pot top. So the top of the pots, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so not brilliant. Okay, so we had neck uh, being the white 
one of these. So no, we all know that the black ones, by the way, can you see what we're doing? We all know that the black ones are the earth, and then we'll go to the common earth. And this is where, by the way, I shall struggle if I have to, if I can't get the uh, temperature up into those, to, to get the pot warm enough to stick these two. So I may have to go and revert to my Draper iron, <laughs> cheapy iron. Okay, now this, um, Mm, that's interesting. That's a single thing that's broken. Ah, okay, so that was the jack socket. I'm going to take that off for a minute. I'll put a new jack line on. Oh, jack line? What kind of connection is this? Oh, it's broken. Oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. It's a broken pot. Who's messed about with this then? <sighs> I see. I see. Right. Okay. Mm, not so good. Let's take one of these. Let's go halfway down its length. Right, we'll make it work. Um, yes, well, I, I might turn the uh, temperature up if mine's underperforming for some reason. Maybe it's just not very efficient. I'll turn it up. If it melts the whole of the iron down, then I'll know it's really faulty. So what I want... Yeah, this has been... Somebody else has had a go at doing various things here. It's a bit of a... It's a bit of a M E double S. Oh, that's interesting. Why is it not factory? Because it's not really had any major modifications made to it that you would think would be a good reason for non standarding it. Okay. So I think it is time to get the old draper out. And, no, actually, you know what? I'll do I'll just melt this thing first. Ah. <laughs> Let's go. Take it up to four, ten, see if I can explode it. Put a blob of solder on the end of that hot wire because uh, I now know that I have to actually sort of dangle that on there in a slightly non-standard way of attaching it. Damnation, you know what I should have done. Uh, gonna make this shorter so I just run over the top. It's lost its lug, basically, this pot somewhere in the in its history. It's been sn snapped off, but it's obviously working. If I can't get this to work, I'll just change it for another one, but now let's put a lump of solder on there. Okay, so I'm going to, I don't know how close we are to being able to see anything. So I'm going to go in and do what we had before, which is to seat this oh, lead. Oh, Christ, I've just gone and turned over the damn wire. <laughs> I hate that. He's stupid. Do you know PVC wire? PVC wire is the worst material in the world. I can't stand it. That thing is now plenty hot. Um, yeah, it's the worst wire in the world, this PVC. It coils around and it doesn't it, it doesn't behave the way you want. And then it sort of flops down on top of Things. Now that, unless I'm mistaken, that not, might not even be connected here the way it should be. So I'm going to um, chuck some more solder on here. So you look how I have to, I have to manipulate the stupid wire out of the way. The PVC, it's just not good. Okay, so I'm chucking a whole load of extra solder on there just to sort of join up this little gap. And that makes that makes the connection better. Okay, so that's my that's my jack socket lead coming out of there. This one's working, although it's got a bit grim. Uh, I tell you what, I'll just let's see if we can melt this down. Amazingly, it's actually behaving. There's a great chunk of solder on there. Let's get rid of this as well. Come on. Uh, so turning the, the 
heat up a little bit has helped. Okay, so I'm going to add a bit of an extra jump wire across to these two pots. Um, but what I'll also do is I'll also hook it in, tie it into the uh, ground wires coming from these pickups. Now these are pushback wires, so they, are, they make it a little bit easier that you can sort of expose the end by pushing them back, which is okay, but if you want it, use a fair bit of wire so you can sort of braid them together or tie them together. The pushback part eventually starts creeping back. <sighs> anyway, he tends not to want to stay pushed back. It's a nice idea. So you've got to strike while the soldering iron is hot. Come on, get in place and twist. Thank you. And then I'm going to tie this little one into it as well, because I need that part of the deal. I can get it to play ball. It's quite difficult to do. And then there's a great big PVC wire in the way of everything again. I'm going to make a great big glob of solder. Right, so that's the jump across from there to there, taken care of. Now I just need to fit this down. Okay, thank you. So those are the first, the neck and the middle pickup grounded. <laughs> we will now place this one, and connect the two pots together. They're technically connected together by the, should be by the um, tin foil uh, on the pick guard, but I always like to connect them together anyway, like whoever has done this one has done just to be on the safe side. There we go. There we go. Right. Ooh. Right. Those are those. That is that. So that's the switch up to the uh, tab to the tone. That's the output there. These two. Right. Cut this back. Never quite know how far out that has to go. Let me just check the distance. Distance is so it's a fair length, isn't it? So we go through that hole. That's about so long. Right here. We'll just get this ready for the um, jack socket in a minute. Okay, okay. So. Um, Yes, this is it's interesting when you, it's always a bit of a detective thing, you know, when you get to look inside a guitar and see what's been done over the years, or what you can tell, or what you suspect has been done. And it's a, it's a sort of appeals to the inner Columbo. Um, you know, it's try and piece together what you think's happened, because there are always telltale clues um, Left behind. So, for example, I know that this elect the electrics in here have been worked on, and yet there's not really a clear sense of why, since the um, since what's in there appears to be pretty standard. Um, so, who knows? Right now, what we've got here is we've got an absolute T O N N E a ton of spare wire which is going to do nothing except get in the way of everything which is a, just a, an absolutely pain in the what's it type of situation so first of all i'm trying to get the first lot of wire out of the way now i need to fold all of this stuff around in a way that hopefully will, will let it fit in the same gap but also keep it pretty much out of the way now that's no good because i 
Can I, from the halfway point, can I reach everything I need to keep reach? <sighs> Possibly. Let's try it. So, and this gets really difficult. So somehow you've got to get the cable tie on. Then you've got to sort of squeeze everything back to where you think you want it. And then you somehow get the tie into place. And I'm going to do it at that end of the whole business so I can pull the business ends forward. So that's hopefully going to allow it to go through to where it needs to go. So this bit sticking out here is the coil split pair. And then we've got a ground. Oh, I see. Uh, let's just double check. We have got, why is that? Oh, that's a bear one that's covered. So the bear and the black are the, um, the bear and the black are the bear and the black, the bear and the black, the screen and black. Yeah. So we've got red and black. Yeah, red and black. So the red is the hot, and these two are the ground of the earth. So the problem is, I'm try and keep them together one way or another. Okay. So yeah. So there's a. We've got to get to the top of a pot, um, and we've got to get the hot one to its correct place, which is uh, this one here. So that's got to be able to do all of that and stay more or less out of the way. So it may be once I've done it, I tie it down with another cable tie as well. So, so let's just join these two together. This is the shielded, the kind of bare wire and the black. Um, let's put a tiny bit of tin onto our hot wire, which is going to go to the switch, but not that long, thank you. Okay, wheel. So the bridge is going to go, let's push this to one side. This is where I have to turn it round because I can't get from that side. So bridge is this first one here. Let's get that out. Bridge is this one here, so let's push that through. These are such tiny, fiddly little connections, it's really marginal. Trim just a tiny bit, lovely. Now we'll take out the middle one, oh, the middle one's yellow. So again, we've got loads of extra room here, but we don't need it, so let's just Let's just lose what we don't need because the worst, the most this is ever going to be fitted in is a scratch plate like this. So this excess wire isn't going to do us any favours at all. So yellow is the middle. So I'll put the yellow here. But we'll push it back, being a pushback wire. <laughs> Theoretically. Come on. Thank you. Oh, quick. Get it through before it stops being a pushback wire. Oh, see, it's just not going through because I squished it. So in the end, I end up doing this. And then I end up cutting a little bit of that off to give me a, a clear run at it and the chance of getting it through a hole. You can't see a damn thing here, I'm sorry, but it is through the hole. And to make it work, I add a little bit of extra solder. PVC wire. I promise the next one I get is going to be silicon. I've, I've eyed up a couple of wires, a couple of soldering irons with silicon. Because, well, it makes all the difference, I think. I had one once before that was silicon and it was just a joy to use. The, the wire just sort of falls down where you need it to be. It doesn't get in the way. So now I'm just hooking up the neck pickup to this part of the switch. It's got quite a bit going through, which is good. Extra solder, which is good. Oh, don't run away. Come back, come back. Did 
down there. Okay, so one more thing to do, and that is, well, a couple more things actually. We'll use blue because they've got a ton of blue left. We'll cut the piece of blue for the claw earth, which we have to get attach. So we've got the claw earth to attach, and we've got this, uh, this humbucker earth. Now, that's in the way, get that out of the way. Can we get this earth up? Is that still attached? Yes, it's attached. Can I attach this one to it as well? So we've got a whole big cluster of groundy things to save making separate blobs of solder. There's a nice connection. Let's add a load of... See that? This freaking wire gets in the way of everything. You could suggest that Putting it somewhere else, holding it somewhere else might make it easier if the wire wasn't going back over, over there. But and that's true, it might. But right now my power points are over there, nowhere else. Okay, so this this bit here now will be a case of let's get we want this we want this wire to all sit down. Right? That one can't go any further because that's attached to the switch so we can't really push that too far that can go under there because it can but it's still pulling a bit too much on the red wire and that can attach to there because it can with my stupid pvc freaking wire getting in the way okay so now i'm imparting some extra groovy heat to everything and now it's absolutely refusing to do the thing Brilliant. Come on. Isn't that funny? Now it's not doing it. Huh. How weird. <sighs> that is just odd. See, that now is coming up with the problems it had before. Just refusing to transfer heat. Come on. Yeah, it's losing it. It's terrible. Losing the heat. Good. Right. Thank you. Be done. There's some old detritus on the top of there from whatever was done there previously. But <sighs> Okay. So now we have that attached to there. Now we have that attached to there. Here is our claw wire, which I'll put some solder on. And then we will test it out with the amp. Make sure the pickups all work before going anywhere near threading it all through the body and hooking up the uh, jack socket. Okay, let's just reality check. So we want these out of the way. I think we can probably now get the last of the Mohican, no, last of the cable ties through here. Let's see if we can get just to help squeeze down that last little bit. Tidy, keep it tidy, possibly. It's pulling quite tightly on the live, the, the hot wire, but it's okay. So there's a, there's the arrangement and um, that should get through that little channel okay. And then this comes out to the, that comes out to the thingy jack and that comes out to the claw. So the first thing I'm gonna do is get my little connector cables out and we're going to hook up the ground and the hot wire and then we're going to connect them up to this here little lamp if we can find where I put the jack socket. Right, since I can't find a good one, I'll use the quick to hand cheap one. 
So the idea is just to basically hook this up to the amp and test out the components. So I'll just drag this round here so it doesn't fall off anywhere. And then we have this to the earth and the other one to the tip, the hot. So that, when we switch the amp on, we should have some action. Right, bridge. Yep. Dribble. Yep. Yep. Middle. On its own. Neck and middle. Yes. Neck. Tone. All good. As is. As it should be. Is as it should be. Lovely. Right. Unhook these test pieces. They're really handy having these little uh, test clips. You can save yourself a ton of time. Oh, now keep the soldering iron on. We're going to need it. So just what I'm going to do at this point, it's a bit of a squeeze, but I'm going to bring the guitar over. Oh, that's my the bridge flapping around. So we bring this over here and we're going to poke this through there. Doesn't want to go, of course. That through there and the ground wire for the claw through the little hole in the back hoping to grab hold of it there and hoping to grab hold of this one there and then we just fit that all back into place and with a bit of luck <laughs> he says it should all neatly snip into place and there shouldn't be anything getting stuck and not going through that stupid little Straits of Hormuz, the Pacifica equivalent. Okay, that is I'm down on there, baby. So I need to, it's, it's sitting up, the, the, I can feel it sitting a little bit on the wires, but it's going to be all right. And it's nearly perfectly good. Uh, let's put some new, they were all a bit rusty, so let's put some new screws in. To go with our lovely new, um, whatever that thing's called. Scratch plate. Okay. Okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's solved the, the issue about whether the holes line up. They're all lined up very well. So that's a good copy. A good um, replacement plate. Okay, so it's all looking good. We'll be ready to um, restring any minute because the neck is all done. So I've got to put the tuners on. Oops. <laughs> Come on. What's wrong with this? Has it got. Oh. That doesn't work. That's a different size for some reason. Why? It's a different screw. That's why. To one side. Um, yes, just uh, the, the, so the frets all done, um, polished out, leveled. Need to replace the tuners and the string up, and we're good to go. That's got me back in the in the, sort of, uh, in the driving seat, shall we say? I wasn't feeling like coming up to the workshop this evening. I'm being feeling tired. Okay, there we have it. So we get our volume and we'll start. Where do we have the volume? We'll start with volume one, one there. Volume one, tone one. Lovely. Switch, thingy, tip. Okay. Uh, uh, we all, now we, all we have to do, well, we're still here, and what you can see, oh, it's not a very good view, is it? <laughs> um, just out the back here, we'll just get these little thingies into place. We'll just check this is tight, it is, that's good. And well, with our special grippy hands, I will, I mean, probably out of shot now, but I will just 
remove the existing solder and bits and bobs that are getting in the way. Yeah, little shards of wire. Thank you. Empties out the clump, clump of solder from the grabber. reason I cannot get a hole through there because this solder sucker is so ancient and useless. Why waste your pucker on some old day sucker? What was that film? That was Toot Sweets. Toot Sweets. That is the uh, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, wasn't it? Right, so that is the one I'm looking at here is the earthy thing. Not a lot of room to work in here, but enough just for now. Let's get that through there. And that won't quite reach to there. Silly chap. <laughs> you can't see very well, nor can I, but there we are. That is it. So you want to go through into there, please. Things don't do what you want them to. It's, oh, thank you. Right. That is that is that and that is that. So that's the hot one and that is the earthy one. Just get them right, Sam. I make the mistake on this one a few times historically, which you don't notice until you put it all back together again and then you realize it doesn't work and you trust, you suspect everything else and finally, the last thing in the entire sequence that you come back and redo and check is the thing that's in, hidden in the tunnel, and that's your jack wiring. And you go, wait a minute, did I actually wire this up back to front? And the answer is, yes, you did. Silly. Now, for some reason, I can neither get the heat through here, nor can I stop myself being dazzled at the same time, which is doing my head in. Thank you. Top that off. A couple of new screws. Try to be out of sight for a minute while I just hook this in the right way. Coil it up a little bit because it's a little bit longer than it needs to be. We'll find our way to. It's not really brilliantly positioned in the, the best of times, but it'll do. So what I'll do is I'll take a short break while I reposition the camera. And uh, we'll be resuming service in time for the finale, which will be putting on the new strings and setting the intonation, etc. Right, that's that for now. Also, I'll put on the springs. Right, power off. Right. For you. Okay, right, we are here to replace some, time to put on some of these mm, sprinks, finally again. Let me take, get, a, get a grip on the springs. <laughs> One. Now with the 10 gauge strings, these should be enough load. We shouldn't need any more. It should work just fine. Okay. Ah, right, next stage step, tuners on. Which means I need to get the 
adjustable spanner. All right, tuner's on. I gave these a clean up too, so it should be nice and fresh. Where's the thing, thing gone that I just had? It wasn't any good because it was the wrong thing. Can I put it back there? Now it's not there. Uh, right, okay, whatever. <laughs> Use it. And there it is, staring me in the face. Would you? Thank you. It looked suspiciously like one of the tuners. That's why my brain didn't register it. I promise you, that's why. Okay, so we're all pretty much done. The precision stuff is done. The uh, wiring's done. Everything's in. We've just got to restring, stretch out the strings and uh, Set the tremolo to a down only motions. And finally, check and set the intonation, which I've moved the saddles, I've taken them off and cleaned them, so um, we expect that to need adjustment, but that's easy enough. Okay. Now I'll just give the tuners a final crank with this. I know people go box spanner, you've got to go. And I always reply by saying I have mostly learned how to use that without doing any damage. Okay, so that's that. We need the thingy, which isn't that, but it's more like that. I'm going to put on the tusk spring tree again. I'm going to try. Lovely. Okay, we've got our strings over here. All these uh, nice, clean, everything's. Right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to put the strings on and then I'm going to see what the bridge needs to do in terms of. Um, Pull of the strings. So basically, start from here, load everything up, and there we are. I think the height of the individual um, saddles may have moved as well. It's always the case that they can move, so I'll, I'll do a final check on those. I won't assume that they're in the right place. Um, So to summarize, Mark, the, the principal reason why this had gone so badly out of whack compared to what you were used to is that your friend uh, added, a, a changed a, a set or went up a massive step in string gauge. Um, that pulled the tremolo so far forward that it not only made it um, you know, sit right up at the angle you saw, but also that raised the playing action a ton as well in this, in, as it did that. Um, plus the fact that the saddles were quite high up on their screws, which meant the action was even higher than it needed to be, even with the tremolo like that. So the whole action had gone skew whiff. Um, and the fact that you, you specified 10 gauge strings told me straight away that obviously that's probably probably where you started with, um, more than likely, and your friend's preference for string, heavy string gauges, sent this thing way out of whack, which is quite common. Um, but it did raise that interesting idea that this tremolo possibly wouldn't really work very well with such heavy gauge strings. So um, it's quite interesting. Uh, also, the neck has a sort of limit. Um, in, in, or the truss rod has a, a, a limit to its adjustability in terms of flattening out. So if we'd have stayed with those those heavy gauge strings, I don't think we'd ever have got the neck out of its state of bow, which um, which would have made playing action feel terrible as well. So 
um, a definite solution on this guitar was not to use that gauge. Now, if, if the neck, if the truss rod had been properly functional or, or as good as it should be, um, then you may have been, you, you would have been able to counteract the, the pull of those huge gauge strings much better. But it just so happens with age, it's gone off the boil and it's not really capable of working against um, such a heavy gauge. It's barely, it's barely working against the 10 gauge um, that we've got on now. So anyway, but it's just about there. And uh, what with sorting out the uh, tremolo and the gauge of strings and everything, we'll get a good playing, very good playing action out of this now, along with the fret leveling. So it'll be unrecognizable as a playing experience. Now I've had, in the last couple of months, the first couple of months of this year, I've had a couple of, two or three interesting uh, comebacks after setups where, where the setup has kind of wandered a little bit, um, or, or the, put it this way, the neck has altered in transit or after transit. And that's been quite interesting. I haven't ever noticed it or heard of it doing that much. Um, so I've put out a, a video which I'll link you to, and it, it'll be, I may make a, another version of it with some pictures, whiteboard stuff, but it'll be a, a video that I send out to everybody who's had me set up a guitar, so that once you get the guitar back, um, if it has changed, the neck shape has changed at all in transit, which it can do, and certainly if it doesn't do in transit, it can, it can do throughout the year, just in terms of climate change, uh, climate, changes in climate, humidity, temperature, and so on. So it's very likely that the neck will change its shape throughout the year, depending on different climate situations. And of course, you need to be comfortable to make countering alterations so that you're not sent having to run to a tech every time that happens. Because it's just a, it's, it's a normal part of having a, a guitar with a neck that's made of wood. So rather than, um, you know, have you kind of, needing to go and pay for a setup every time that happens. I've made a video which tries to explain um, why it is, what changes, why it changes, um, and most importantly, how um, getting to grips with your truss rod is the most effective way of you being confident to counter those changes when they occur. Not if they occur, but when they occur, because they will, almost certainly will. Um, so that's really important to no, um, I say I may remake the video um, with some, include some graphics to help clarify what I'm on about. Um, so, but yes, it, the the changes, if any, will be. be almost certainly um, the neck either flattening out a little bit more or bending a little bit more and the result of that of course is that it will if the neck bends a little uh, the guitar will go out of tune um, if it flattens a little it'll go out of tune as well but in in the case of it flattening out it'll go sharp and if it um, if it curves more it'll more than likely uh, go flat so sometimes it's been very helpful when customers have got a guitar that's changed in transit and they've told me um, which, which of those things has occurred. And it, it's often been um, a, a lowering of the action um, accompanied by the introduction of some buzz uh, and, an, and the guitar detuning, oh, actually, sorry, going sharp. So that, that it all of it sort of points towards it flattening out um, after transit. When it's been cold, maybe in the back of a van, then it goes into somebody's home. Okay, so I've just, right now, set that to the tiniest bit of downward motion on the tremolo, um, which is 
not it's cool it'll it'll give you that um, shimmer effect if you want it but it won't um it won't have any impact on the tuning uh, nor nor with a tusk nut and a tusk string tree you'd be able to use this guitar with a floating tremolo as well uh, it's just it, it's no real need to have that um if you're not going to use it and the reason the reason i always say to somebody don't have the tremolo floating unless um you are a tremolo user um and that's because uh, if the only downside is if i set it up floating it requires that the action well it the action goes up when you've set the tremolo floating and if you later on decide to bring it down i should take these stupid plastic things off before i really hate them <laughs> If um if you need to set it down later on, the uh, the problem you've got is that the action uh, then goes down with it, um, and so you you have to be prepared to reset the playing action as well, raise it slightly, and that can be a bit daunting for some people. So um, I I tend to say from the outset, unless you are you know that you're a tremolo user then don't set the uh, action floating, don't set the tremolo floating. However, a safe compromise is uh, is to set it down only because even if you want to further tighten the springs down, which you can do, um, you won't get any change in the action by making further adjustments. There we go. Let's get rid of all of this plastic, which drives me crazy. See, it's just in the way still. How absolutely annoying. I think there's a, still another layer of plastic on top of this scratch plate, by the way, which you may have to take off. Um, can't remember if it's one or two. Okay, so the thing next, once we've, now we've got the tremolo set where we want it, um, I'll now double check the string action using the string action gauge. And we'll, we'll double check the neck relief as well. And the grime off my fingers. Okay. So let's just check the relief one more time. Okay, it's still good. Um, that's about as flat as we're going to get this neck. There's no doubt about that. Um, now I'm going to check the last fret action, as I call it, and that's a little bit low. So 1.5 across to 1.2, and there's no point going any lower because you'll just, I will just end up with introducing buzz into the game, and that will just be a bit of a downer. There's no point. I've learned the hard way not to push it too far. It's great, you know, I, I sort of, I see it as my ego challenging me to get the lowest possible action. But the downside about having a really low action is that if if I send a guitar back to the customer and I've got it at its absolute rock bottom lowest action, then all it takes is a, a whiff of the central heating when it gets to the other house to make the tiniest change to the shape of the neck. And as soon as that happens, um, as soon as the neck changes a tiny bit of shape, the a little bit of clearance that was in there before um, because of the very very low action disappears um, and before you know it it's buzzing where it wasn't before and then a customer is understandably miffed and they think it's not worked so there's a you have to learn i have to learn the hard way <laughs> i learned the hard way not to over go into overkill with setting too low an action my sort of, you know, like I say, I, I like, I love the challenge part of it and I, I tend to not be able to stop myself trying to set it really low, but it isn't, it's no good for me or anyone. Right. So that's the action set. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch out the strings. I haven't sliced my thumb. Um, oh, that's interesting. This the pickups. Have, I've got some, there must be some. There must be some um, f uh, filings on on the uh, from that on that bench over there where these pickups have been. So it's picked up some some filings. That's interesting. Not it'll do any harm, but yeah, I don't 
dust. It's basically iron, iron filings. Right, um, so what I'm going to do is stretch these out. Um, and when you change your strings, I recommend you do this between thumb and forefinger. Like I said, I just, I just sliced my thumb, so I'm not going to do it as well as I should. Um, I've said lots of times before that the secret to tuning stability is, is the, um, getting the nut slots right and using the right material, which we've done with this tusk nut. We haven't cut the slots at all, and they, they, as they came out of the factory, which is a really good aspect. Um, so getting your nut right, both in terms of material and the height of the slots, the height of the strings over the first fret, that's, I, I kind of equate that to 50% of your tuning stability in the long term. The other 50% is down to stretching the slack out of your strings. So get that thumb and forefinger stretching business going and I would recommend you do it three or four times round. I'm not going to do it tonight because my fingers are a bit shredded I'm afraid. So I'm going to try and do it the best I can this way. Um, however you do it, thumb and forefinger or a bit like this or by doing large bends, you just keep going until you can't detune your strings anymore by stretching them. And once it's in that state, then you are stretched out, baby. See, that's still in tune. Hmm. Hmm. Good. Stable, baby. Okay, I'm going to put the uh, little uh, thing back, that thing that's called the truss rod cover doofer. Let's guide it into its little hole. No, not back to front, you won't, idiot. There you go. Uh, and now after that, we've got, oh yeah, we've got the back plate to put on. And we're good to go. Oh, the intonation, yeah, that, that's that bit. Trying to find where is the screw going in. <laughs> Kidding me. Can't see what's going on. Ah, uh, things are hard. Where is the screw hole? I've lost track of it. It must be going in sideways. Oh, I've gone either that or I've gone mad. It is going in sideways. Crikey. Slant, that's why I wasn't getting there. Okay, um, so we've got a couple of little adjustments to do, first of all. So pickups, um, people say, where should the pickups be? And the answer is, wherever you want them. Um, some people like the pickups to be at about three millimeters underneath the string at its lowest point. So I'm holding it down here. Um, other people don't like it there and the bottom line is the answer is really 
based on your personal preference and experimentation. So the rule of thumb is this, the closer to the pickup your, uh, sorry, closer to the strings your pickup poles are, um, the greater the output, but the, perhaps the, might be the less the tonal dynamic, um, people would say. That's the, that's the conventional wisdom, all right? The further they are from the strings, the, and I say the lower they, the further they are, the, the lower the output, the greater the tonal dynamics. So it works in kind of in inverse to distance. So it's entirely um, up to you. Now this, this bridge pickup is a pretty high output jobby. So you may well find that you want that one to be lower all round because it's such a high output. I can't remember what its rating was, something like 14K or something like that. It's, or resistance, I should say. Let's get these heights exactly right. Eyeballs. So this is, like I said before, this is so sensitive to quarter millimeter um, height or adjustments here. I've leveled to exactly one and a half millimeters. And if this is below it, which it currently is, then you, you may well hit the, the buzz. And that's why it's kind of critical that I get these right because the, the target action that I level to is a minimum. Sometimes by the time I've finished messing about getting it right, I'm back down below the minimum and I wonder why it won't, um, you know, it's, it's buzz is creeping back in. So all of these I've been under cooking it a little bit so i need to bring them back up to the correct height and stop being tempted to go under the mark as i as you heard me quite rightly accusing myself of just a minute ago that's now it's a bit too high now because there's no no happy outcome when it's not right and again, it's a bit eyeballing, really. This is not this is not a scientific measurement, as you can tell. It's just looking at the thing and going, I think that's about right. Okay. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug this into the amp. I'm going to check the intonation, check the pickups for sound. I know they make sound, but check them, see what they sound like. Uh, if I can, what have I done with the, the jack, jack plugs sort of gone for a walk. Oh dear, is this not a good one? That's weird. disappeared a, a decent quality lead in fact there's one that's a yellow one but I don't know I don't know I don't know right so first thing I'm going to do is get around to it I'm going to sorry the camera view will now be lousy let's use this one oh, crikey. all right uh, 
right, let's do the, ch -ch 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 -ch, the intonation first. Right. So again, intonate. Now the intonation is a much maligned, misunderstood thing, which is really only about, it's about, um, it's about distance. actually, I guess right. It's actually right. <laughs> well guessed. Well, guest, guest, let's have a listen to these ow, new pickups. Oh, God. Suppose we ought to put in the tr tr tremolo arm while we're at it. Just um, keep the tremolo decked out.
It's interesting, this, I'm really noticing this guitar is very acoustically resonant when the strings are um, off, when the pickups are off. It doesn't have the sustain that I'm used to. The, um, how the, the transmission of the energy into the wood takes away from the... the kind of long life of the notes.
Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, we are done. Let's turn that off. So, uh, yeah. So uh, maybe that's maybe that's my thing about the the um, Pacifica. Maybe it's that it is resonant. Um, I, I I think I prefer. I think I am by default a heavy. I like a heavy glassier guitar that has stronger, longer sustain or different, yeah, different sort of different sustain to this. There's a definite difference. I can tell a difference um, because the, the energy on the light body, I can hear it making the, um, making the uh, wood move is interesting um, and that's where you know if, if your guitar the type of guitar you have makes makes the wood sing it's a uh, some of the energy is going into that um, which may otherwise be going into string sustain so there's something about this that feels like it doesn't have as much sustain as a heavier strats that I like um, but that's a personal preference so I'm just gonna um, over over the next day or so, I'm going to double check the truss rod or the relief on this because it's I cranked it quite hard earlier on and I'm going to hope that it's done all its adjusting. Um, I think it's pretty much where it should be. But, you know, it was stiffened up against the, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really ha that, that happy to be cranked that hard. Um, there wasn't a lot of adjustment in it, so it's it's kind of come towards the end of its life, uh, truss rod wise, but still just enough to get it working, which is fine. Uh, let's take off the cover off here. So we'll put this on. Hmm. Yeah. Specifically, I'm getting to getting to see a lot of them and getting to getting to know them. Right, these are in good shape. We'll use these for the back. Yes. Come along. Ah, stay in the thing, will you? Okay, that's it for today. Tomorrow we've got the um, let's get the other thing because it's going to be better fit. Tomorrow we've got the, what's it called? The, hmm. Oh, blimey. Levinson. Levinson. Levinson blade. That's what we've got. I keep losing screwdriver bits. It's probably because it's over there, isn't it? No. Oh. Is it because it's up? No, that's gone as well. Uh, right, tidy up needed. Um, yes, tomorrow's the Levinson, so it'll be interesting for me to compare the two against each other. Uh, this one's uh, slightly off the mark, this shape, so we're going to. This one's going in a little bit less than square but there we go all right so pickups changed um bridge components changed bridge taken back down locked down um tusk nut tusk string tree tune is cleaned whole body cleaned neck tightened up um strap buttons in good shape we'll just double check this one down here Mm -hmm. Make sure it's on properly and then we'll be done. Intonation check. Good visual guess, guess on my part. Um, Okie dokie. I guess it picks up dust already.
if um if you don't want to use the tremolo at all um you don't want that take the back off and screw the claws screws all the way into the wall and then this won't move at all and take the arm off obviously okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to collect up the spare parts and put them all together and we're done on this one see you for a levinson blade tomorrow